Okay, so good afternoon. Sorry for the technical hitch that we had there initially. So uh, welcome to our session today, um, an introduction to direct instruction. I'm Emma Chambers and your host for today's session. But before we get started, I am just going to hand it back to Asana, who's going to talk us through some housekeeping points. So over to you, Asana. Um, do you still want to do the agenda for covering the housekeeping? Yeah, I'll just... That's fine, just I think move on to the um, housekeeping, please. Cool, um, thank you. So just to cover a few things before we begin, um, if you are experiencing any audio issues during the call, we would recommend using your phone to call in rather than um, your PC. And anyway, if you do have any technical issues, do just flag it in the chat box as well. Um, any high kind of throughput networking apps that you are using at home or on your network could impact your bandwidth as well. So any Netflix, YouTube or gaming platforms that anyone else is using on the same network will impact it. Um, but if you do miss anything, we are recording the session and we'll be circulating the recording afterwards as well. Um, and there will be Q&A opportunities at the end. So do use the chat box and the Q&A um, box on the right hand side to drop in comments, questions as well that you may have. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, we can't unfortunately unmute your mics or you can't put your videos on, but like I said, use the Q&A box, the chat box, um, ask questions, leave your comments, and we will be moderating that on the side as well. And I'll hand that back over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, so as I say, I am your host for this afternoon, and our speakers are Susie Kudapath and Kevin Surrey, who I will introduce to you in a little while. So as I say, my name is Emma Chambers, and I'm the Account Manager for Schools in the UK and Europe. I'm very happy to be your first point of contact at McGraw-Hill, and I've worked at McGraw-Hill for a number of years now, and there's one thing I know that I'm kind of passionate about, which is direct instruction. And that's because I'm excited by the progress that students make when a direct instruction program is implemented and delivered effectively by teaching professionals. And whilst direct instruction is not new to us at McGraw-Hill, we are very proud to be in partnership with the DI hubs in the UK. The hubs provide training locally to support teachers to implement and deliver our direct instruction programs. Earlier, earlier this year, we were thinking about how we could share our excitement and passion for direct instruction with teachers. Originally, we were planning a kind of brunch and learn event, but uh, we figured that now that everybody is a, I'm going to say Zoom expert, but based on the experience we've had with this call, maybe not so <laughs> expert as we were <laughs> anticipating, um, but certainly better than we thought we would be six months ago. So we obviously felt that a webinar was the way forward to get that message out. So the only downside to that is that you will have to make your own coffee, I'm afraid. So <laughs> the purpose for this session is to uh, help unravel the mystery of direct instruction programs and how they can really help to close the attainment gap, which we know is increasing. The presentation today is just an introduction to direct instruction, as we appreciate that many of you will have seen little or none of the content that will be shared with you. The webinar is scheduled for an hour, so it should last, well, it should finish at 4.30, um, and obviously appreciate that we're running a little bit late already. Based on that fact, any questions that we don't get to answer at the end of the session, we will follow that up in an email with you, so don't worry if we don't get to answer your question. So in a moment, I will pass you over to Susie and Kevin. So just to introduce them, Susie Kudapas and Kevin Surrey are Directors of Direct Instruction with United Learning and are subject matter experts. They've delivered direct instruction lessons for a number of years and have been trained by NIFTI, um, and that stands for the National Institute for Direct Instruction in the US. They now lead the DI South Hub based at Avonbourne Academy, Bournemouth. So, Susie and Kevin, over to you. Thank you very much, Emma. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for um signing in today. Um, it's just nice to see a number of um, um, educators who have shown an interest in direct instruction. Um, can we um, move the slide, please, if that's okay? So, so I think there's a poll section on this, on this function, whether we could see the number of um, people who have joined today, whether we, they, are, they have delivered DI or know what DI is. 
All right, Cindy, you should be able. To, yeah, you should be able to move the slides yourself. I've made Kevin the presenter. So oh, right, can okay. you move? Sorry, the, I apologize. Yep, that's okay. That's it should be the good. white bar at the side of the screen. Oh yes, yeah. sorry. Yeah. We're new to WebEx. Everyone's so apologies. <laughs> <laughs> We're WebEx, <laughs> not WebEx. <laughs> WebEx. Yeah. So um, hi guys. Yeah. So let's get started. I just want to have a quick poll really just to find out um, who's um familiar with direct construction. I think um. There is a, there is an option on the on the right hand side there with where you can actually put um, your hands up there. Can everyone see that on the right hand side? So just to give us an idea whether you're familiar with direct instruction. Okay, so we've got some we've got some here who are familiar with terminology direct instruction and. Um, some if you haven't who who aren't. So just to give you a bit of background, because there's some obviously confusion between the big DI and the small DI, which Kev's gonna go through shortly with you. But direct instruction, big DI, is an explicit, carefully sequenced and scripted model of instruction. Um just and shine, okay. Um we'll see that it does cover those elements uh in, in direct instruction. Okay, so what the years of extensive research um uh, at least the impact proven to work. Um it does choose teaching for explicit demonstration of practice. Uh it should the opportunity to succeed, and this is what we find uh, most rewarding out of this. It's the students that are really sick with it in education really give them an opportunity to succeed, and it really does build their confidence. The children that talk their current skill level rather than their age expected. Very, very important uh, when we do the placement testing, which we'll talk about a bit later, but the children are sort of their skill levels, not what they're expected. Uh, to be learning at that, their age, and the direct instruction accelerates academic progress and also an improvement in behaviour as well. Only 10 to 15 percent of new new only 10 sorry 10 to 15 percent of new learning takes place within a lesson. The rest of it is retrieval practice of previously learned skills. And it's a step by step approach that makes direct instruction a really powerful tool. It moves itself on a tracked curriculum rather than a sparring curriculum. So whereas we would do, for instance, in maths, we may do fractions for a few weeks in a unit in a year, and then they, the children won't be exposed to fractions again until the following year. With direct instruction, once something's been introduced to the lesson, that remains in all the subsequent, subsequent lessons afterwards, retrieving the practice. Okay. Unless children are absolutely secure in the basic skills, then learning remains painful and difficult and an obscure process for them as well as other teachers. Every child on a DI program will achieve and close gaps by following the program specifically how it was intended. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later because it's, uh, it's really, really important that we follow what Engelman wrote. Okay, so just to go through our reservations, um just give you a background about how we came about with direct instruction. So about three years ago, um, we were introduced to DI at Magna Academy, which is where we started delivering to our year seven. And of course, like you know, like many teachers, you know, we're going to have some reservations. We're going to have these concerns as to, you know, what is DI. Um, so we're just going to go through our reservations. I'm sure um, you could um, you can probably relate to ours as well. So um, the first reservation, um, DI is a, you know, a fad, could it perhaps be a current word in education? And we've come across that, especially with, you know, practices that are introduced in our teaching. Um, how could we possibly teach via a script? And obviously, if you've delivered DI, you will, you will see the kind of format of the script. And does it change you as a teacher? Does it change the way you teach? Um, and as well, if you look at the content um, of, the, of, the, of the program as well, could the content appear too basic for our year sevens coming in uh, into into secondary. 
The children and us as teachers would turn into robots. If you've delivered direct instruction, you will see the, the kind of the structure of the lessons. It's very much that unison response, that call and response, and the students answering on the signal. How are we ever going to show this to the to Ofsted or an Ofsted inspector? They came into the school, and DI being too teacher led. So these were some of the concerns that Kevin and I, you know, had when we first started delivering DI. Um, so we wanted to share that with you as well. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a background to uh, Stig Eggleman. Stig, Stig is the is the is the guy as you, as you may know who uh, who wrote all the um, the programs. Um, when he apparently went through university, I don't know how true this is, but it's, it's, it's written in a very good book called Clear Teaching um, by, uh, by Shepard Barbush that we really recommend uh, as a read, um, that he actually went through university studying psychology without actually uh, reading a book. So I'm not sure how true that is. But I think the main thing to take from this was how he began um, his, uh, his his journey really into education, and um, he he started off working in marketing. He worked for a candy store, and he was tasked with um, trying to find a way to get children to remember things so they would buy the candy bars. And he started to he started to link this with um, with education and how children remember, and it's all through you know, repetition. Okay, so he, he, a little experiment now. I mean, you don't have to put your hands up. But I'm going to, I'm going to say a few uh, um, slogans from ad adverts. Um, some of you who are very young won't remember some of these. But let's see if you can remember some of them. And I'm, I'm sure you'll be chanting along wherever you're sat at the moment. But uh, a finger of fudge is just enough to give your kids a treat. You do the shaken back and put the freshness back. A Mars a day helps you work, rest, and play. These are adverts that were on 35 years ago, but we remember them. We remember those slogans. And Engelman, Engelman started to experiment, and I know that I use that word loosely, but experiment with his two sons on how they could remember mathematical facts. And he, he actually got his two five-year-old uh, twin boys, uh, Kurt being one of them, to uh, actually do end up doing simultaneous, uh, not simultaneous, he was doing some basic equations in algebra. Um, and it's, it's a great little video to watch that you can find on our website, on, on Nifty's website, or if you look it up on YouTube. But it, it's, it's really intriguing to see how the children learn. And that's where he developed his direct instruction from. Okay, so um, just to give you the philosophy of direct instruction, so all students can be taught. Now, what we tell a lot of schools that when we actually visit schools and, and train is that the program or direct instruction doesn't discriminate. Okay, so just don't make the assumption whether this child, um, this student is, you know, a, you could say they could qualify for direct instruction, but don't make that assumption. This is why it's really important that you do the placement test with your student. So EALs, anyone with any kind of type of learning difficulty, it doesn't discriminate. All students improve academically and their self-image also develops. And you will find that those students who normally are sent out of lessons or those students who are sent to isolation are the students that can't actually access the work. So what they do is they play up in the lesson, they get sent out, and what they're doing is they're missing a chunk of their education. So in, when they are um, when they are in direct instruction, you will see straight away the behavior and the self-image um, improves drastically. You do see that massive improvement in them. All, all teachers can succeed if provided with adequate training and materials. Now, we do a lot of training, a lot of talks, a lot of CBDs, and we do seem to work with a lot of teachers um, in secondary schools. And we do find that where they haven't had the training, um, it seems to not work for them or there's something they're not finding that's you know that's actually working so if they're given the adequate training material then they will find that you know they will succeed low performers and disadvantaged learners must be taught at a faster than typical rate if they are to catch up with their high performing peers now we're not talking fast where it's trying to accelerate very quickly it's about that pace that that you know that first pace where they're able to kick, when they go back into their normal subject 
are able to keep up with their higher performing um, peers. So it's about taking their time. It's not rushing it, but still being taught at the same pace as they would be if they were in their core subjects. Okay, this is one of my favourite quotes from England. It's very uh, apt at this time of uh, lockdown when um, you know uh, it's in the news and it's widely um, acknowledged now by many people about the gaps in learning. But time is a teacher's worst enemy, and every time the clock ticks in favour of the advantaged kids and against the disadvantaged kids. At this at this time. So we've got D, the capital DI versus the little DI debate, and uh, we, we, we see that quite a lot. Okay, so for some of you who are familiar with Rosenstein's principles of instruction, just to kind of clarify there, so um, a lot of Barrack Rosenstein's teaching principles all kind of came from Engelman's work, and Kat's going to talk through um, a bit about that in a second. But in terms of kind of understanding the differences between, you know, DI, big DI and small DI, is that DI is the program um, that Engelman had created, and small DI are Rosenshine's principles of best teaching um, practice. Okay, so in 1976, um, Barrett Rosenshine identified a set of variables uh, that related to student achievement. So it engaged time, small group instructions, and specific and immediate feedback. And you find these in direct instruction lessons. Um, Rosenshine took, used the term direct instruction to, to describe this set of variables. Um, and as Susie said, what, what um, Engelman did, he wrote a program of work. So they're actually letter, uh, lessons, scripted lessons, whereas the small di is the practices, the good teaching practices that come from that. And it's, it's, a, it's common to think that it, it, a lot of people that know Rosenshine, when they see a DI lesson, say, oh, all these, all these uh, act, uh, practices are in uh, Engelman's direct instruction lessons. And they are. But Engelman didn't write his lessons based on Barrett Rosenshine's work. They were written long before. And in fact, Barrett Rosenshine went to the same university as Sig Engelman. And um, it was actually Barrett Rosenshine that, that, that sort of latched on to SIG and took his principles, that what, what he wrote, from Engelman's lessons. So actually, it's the other way around, where Barrett Rosenshine looked at direct instruction lessons, capital DI, from Engelman, and formed his principles based about those lessons. And it seems to be quite a sensitive topic with um, the National Institute of Direct Instruction, because obviously we have regular meetings with them, um, which is weekly meetings. And when you mention Rosenstein's principles, it seems to be quite a, a sore, um, yeah, it's not a very popular subject to bring up. But just to give you an idea behind that, if you if you are familiar with Rosenstein's and you do use those, um, use it in your school, um, just to give you an idea where it's all come from. I think that Rosenstein's principles have sort of been spread, and, uh, and many, many schools use them, whereas direct instruction got a little bit left behind. And when I talk about project follow through, um, I will, I will uh, tell you why direct instruction never really took off. Which leads me on to project follow through. So project follow through was conducted in America in 1960, where it started in 1967, and it was one of the most uh, extensive educational experiments ever conducted in America. And it was the, 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 the point of it was to try and find a way of teaching at risk, uh, at risk children. And there were nine models that, that came forward, direct instruction being one of them. There were over 200,000 children uh, involved in the study. There were 178 communities across America covering a full demographic. The nine model groups uh, were put into three, uh, were, were given a focus. So it was either academic focus, so knowledge retention, problem solving, or self-esteem. If you can see the graph, there were some strong, clear results at the end of it. It lasted 10 years. There was over half a billion dollars put into this project. And DI showed that not only did it um, come out better with academic 
um, the, the academic focus, but also the problem solving and the self-esteem. It also found that DI students had higher um, confidence, which led them to go on to further education. So many of the students that, that, that were in Project Follow Through doing direct instruction actually finished secondary school to pursue higher education. And remember here we're talking about at-risk children, children that, that would not normally happen. So it, project, it produced the best results in all areas, basic skills, the problem solving, the self-esteem. Most of the other models, as you, as you may have seen from the graph, were less effective than the traditional schooling, yet many of those still remain today. And there were, there, there's some reasons for that. The first one was at that time, it was a very constructivist um, um, mindset about education. So your sort of uh, your your projects, your Piaget's theories, they were very very the in thing, and direct instruction didn't fall into that category. So it wasn't expected to win, and it was it was dismissed. <coughs> there was also there was also a lot of people in in higher positions in government that were, shall we say, friends with educationalists who were expected to win. And uh, Stig Engelman was looked down upon um, because of his, his background. He, he worked in a, a car showroom. He worked in a, a candy bar store. He wasn't seen as being a academic. So he, they, they looked down on him for that. And it's another reason they sort of dismissed direct instruction. But the other thing that's really important and what I've just read is that if you imagine what life was like in America during the 1960s, 70s, <laughs> with the African-American communities, the Hispanic communities, there was a lot of in industrial uh, institutional racism going on. And because Engelman was uh, working with a lot of those communities, the, the African-American, the Hispanic communities, and they were being educated, very sadly, the government um, saw that as a sort of threat. They didn't really want Hispanic and African American being educated, and it was suppressed. It was like um, suppressing the masses, really. And uh, I, I find that the saddest thing when I read about it. Um, why why direct instruction didn't formally get rolled out and the, and the, the findings formally published as as they were promised to be. Okay, so just going to go through a quick case study of one. Um, it was basically, we worked with McGraw here and we put together our, um, you know, just looked at some of the data that we've um, been, um, that we've actually put together. Now, we have a lot of schools that phone us up asking the question, um, can, you, uh, can you show us how direct instruction works? Can you prove it? Now, we can't actually prove it there and then, but what we can do is, you know, show you a case study. Um, where we've worked with students and delivered um, direct instruction. Okay, so uh, it was about 2017 at Magna Academy we were asked to deliver direct instruction. Now, student A is just our main focus for student A. We had a ranking system at Magna Academy where students were ranked, and student A was right at the bottom of her year group. Now, it just wasn't student A. It was the whole stream, bottom stream, the students in her group. We purely focused on student A. Um, because of her, you know, her progress um, throughout the first year of implementation. Okay, so just going to talk through um, student A. So student A, um, I'm sure you've come across this kind of student in your classroom, very little confidence, but often hide away uh, behind other students, would become tearful. Now, for those delivering direct instruction, will know that it's very, the scripts are very um, consistent. So the student would know when to um, when certain tasks would appear in the script, so like i.e. The, re the, the, um, the reading task, you know, the fluency checkout, this student would make an excuse to want to go to the toilet perhaps, so she'd get tearful because she didn't want to read in front of her peers. This student would have put, um, poor fluency with basic calculation. Now, she was una unable to comprehend word and math problems simply because she couldn't read, so she couldn't read in English, she couldn't read in math. She'd be confused by lack of basic mathematical knowledge and no logical reasoning. Now, as you can see there, there are some quotes. Now, we are very lucky um, in terms of, um, we were able to re um, record the students, video uh, record, um, sorry, voice record them, 
at the start of um, direct destruction. As you can see, there's some quotes, I'll let you read those. But as you can see there, the first one, the red box, the student A has said, I tried to DI in year seven and I wasn't confident in reading. Now I taught this student in year seven for both core and DI. And I could honestly say um, she had a, read, a very low reading age of six and really struggled to read a simple sentence. Okay, so student A, so this is after um, first year of implementation, student A developed much better confidence in self-esteem. Now this is a child who would hide away, so now a child who would put her hand up and put herself forward to ask questions in the classroom. She enjoyed learning. Now you could tell this by her, her, you know, just the way she looked as she comes through the door, that big smile on her face. You know, and her mum giving, you know, phoning in saying how pleased she was. And the fact that she was even asking for book vouchers for Christmas and birthdays and even told the head teacher at the time that she'd asked for book vouchers. So she developed, um, she became much more fluent in reading and in calculation. And they developed a much broader mathematical knowledge. Because she could read in English, she can now um, answer word and math problems for logical reasoning and develop a range of strategies to help solve these problems. And you will find that um, it wasn't just in her core English and math, she was able to use the BI strategies and have other subjects as well. Again, there's some quotes there, so this is from the recordings after the first year. So in red there, once I started DI, I became more confident. DI has helped me a lot. And there's some lovely, um, some lovely feedback there from her peers, where it says now, um, sorry, no, sorry, I just focus on the yellow box there, which I forgot, she says now when I read, when I get to a word I don't know, I do all the things that I have been doing in DI. And there's some lovely um, quotes here. Her math is amazing. She can do it so fluently. And another one says she's more confident. Okay, just to back this up with some data. Um, we, we gave the students um, GCSE papers every six weeks at Magna. We were quite brutal in our assessments, really. Uh, so to get 5% was actually not too bad. But you can see how she improved on her assessments throughout the year from 5% to getting scoring 23% at the end. Uh, in direct instruction, her mastery test, her first mastery test was 56%. And after going through the remedies um, and, and, and following all the practices, by the end of the year, she was on 99%. Uh, and that's the max. Uh, for English, her reading age started at uh, 6.04, that's not, not negative 6.04, at 6.04, and by the end of the year, she was at 11.9, so run up where she, she should be at her age expected, and for English, her uh, direct instruction assessment, 63% on her first mastery, and again, following all the, the remedies that are put in place by the end of the year, she was uh, scoring 100% first time on her mastery test. She actually did so well, she actually moved up to be ranked top of the stream above. And that was quite reflective of most of that class. Actually, I, I believe it was about 85, 86% of the class moved up a, a, a step. And in year eight, there, there was this, like, this, this whole flip over effect with the, with, the, uh, with the set that was above them. Okay, so when we when we have a when we come out and look at people um, as part of our role, there's four things we look for in a direct instruction classroom. Um, there's uh, the efficiency of the instruction, the effectiveness of the instruction, the proper placement, as we spoke about earlier, and the main thing which underpins everything that we do in DI is the student engagement. So efficiency of instruction. Are the classroom set up to allow easy flow and access of materials? And this is usually this is something that we've probably got set up in our classes anyway. Are the transitions between lessons smooth and fluent? <clears throat> Does the instruction start on time and last the full period? So this, this is a sort of a whole, whole school ethos about how you get children from one class to the other. But with COVID at the moment and the, the bubbles that they're in, it's about the teachers getting to the next classes um, efficiently. Um, are the workbooks and equipment out ready to use? So we have the workbooks out ready for the students, so when they enter the classroom, it's all out ready for them. Are the transitions within the lesson between exercises smooth and fluent? 
And is the lesson progressing? Are you making that, that progress that Sue you spoke about regarding pace? I think one of the things that, uh, that Richard Tutt, who's a head teacher or overseas teaching and learning there from United Learning, when he was their head teacher, was maximizing every minute. Um, and that, that really is very, very um, uh, true of direct instruction. It's about maximizing every minute getting these children to catch up. Yeah, and what you will find is that you will have that one student who will come in and say, I've forgotten my pencil case, and what they do is they go to the other classroom and they'll get it and they spend about 10 minutes trying to find it. Whereas obviously now with these bubbles, it's our responsibility to get to the classroom, but also the fact to provide that equipment. So like maximizing every minute. So as soon as they come in, there's a pencil, there's a green, there's a green pen, there's their workbook and their student book. So you're ready to start straight away without relying on that student to actually have that equipment. Okay, so the effectiveness of instruction mastery. Now, you know, we do, we do get phone calls and we, you know, no question's a silly question, but we do get um, phone calls like, I've been delivering decoding B, uh, B2 or decoding C for a year. This is for English, for those English specialists who are here today. Um, but we're not seeing any progress at the end of the year or we do a mastery test and then my students are still getting seven errors, or we're doing a workbook exercise in my class. I've got five students in my class that are still making five errors. So just to give you an idea, if you haven't had the training, it's really important that you know about the, um, the mastery. So, so this includes rates of errors low enough that a lesson is complete and a, a, a lot of time. So what we're trying to do is, is that a lot of teachers have delivered DI under this, in, in, in core, as teachers, we are, we have deadlines. We've got to try and teach um, the, the curriculum in a very short space of time. DI is not about that. DI is about lesson by lesson. It's about completing the lesson. You can do lesson one over three days. It's not about rushing the lesson. So it's not like I have year seven on a Monday period two, I will do lesson one. Then I had them on Tuesday, lesson one, I would do lesson two. That's not how it works in DI, and this is where the misconceptions are not addressed immediately. And then obviously over time, you'll find your students are making more errors. So it's really important that you master each exercise by exercise. And it doesn't matter if you do exercise one, lesson one over, I don't know, 30 minutes of the lesson. It's about getting 100%, um, as it leads on to the next one, 100% firm on all task and activities presented as individual terms as well as um, um, the, the exercise in the lesson. So if you, if you only get up to exercise four in a direct instruction lesson on, le on, on that one hour, it doesn't matter, you continue the next lesson. It's about 100% mastery for each activity. For the independent work, when you reach the workbook exercise, it's really important that your students are mastering up to 85% and above. If your students aren't achieving over 85%, we, we do provide trackers, which is really important. You're trained on how to use these trackers, is if your students um, aren't mastering over 85%, the tracker will tell you whether to reteach that lesson again or to work individually with those students at home, um, with, where they've got misconceptions in their workbook. If, you're, if your class isn't achieving over 85% as a class, then you will have to reteach that lesson again. You do not move on to the next lesson if you don't master that particular lesson. It's really important then what happens is when you get to mastery, um, a mastery test at the end of the program, you will find your students are 100% each time. 80 to 100% of performance and mastery test. By the time you get to mastery, if you're mastering each section on each of the lessons leading up to mastery, then you shouldn't be testing any students with, with anything more than three errors. Yeah, and just saying uh, what Susie said about the, the uh, three junctures of mastery, it's the exercise by exercise. We've just, we had an inquiry that someone's workbook exercises, they have to keep repeating it. And, you know, the first thing we look at is, are you rushing through the exercises in the lesson? If you can, if you can master the exercise through the oral responses, um, then when they get to the workbook exercise, they should find that easier but if you if you sort of skipped over the first juncture of mastery then you're going to find the problems in the workbooks and if you don't address those like soon as you said for the 85 percent you'll find you've got a problem when they get to their mastery test so it's exercise by exercise is the first juncture of mastery the other thing we look at is, is the placement of the students and as i said before they're taught at their skill level not at their what they're expected to be learning at their age 
So all students are uh, placement tested before being assigned a group. Okay. If they are in a group where they're placed too low, they're going to become bored. If they're in a group where the work is too hard, they're going to become overwhelmed. And so it's about teaching them at their skill level. It's taught in these um, homogenous groups with similar skills and learning rates, and they're grouped together as much as possible. Now, in America, they have a great model where in, in primary school there, for example, they might have a, a, a year six student working in a class with some year threes and some year fours because they're working at the same skill level. We don't have, we, we, we don't have the capacity or the ability to do that in the United Kingdom. If you are in a school where you can do that, that's fantastic, and I'd love to see that. But the, the, we can help you with the placement testing to try and help you form your groups and tell them tell you where to start. Um, the teacher efficiency brings all the students to mastery by reducing the ratio of interaction. So it's about them becoming independent and firming up those weaker students. And there is the challenge in there for the more capable students. The students in the lower levels um, are instructed in small groups of 15. We don't recommend with the corrective maths and the corrective reading programs that you have more than 15 in a group. It becomes a little bit too hard to manage um, and you, you, you lose that, um, uh, uh, what's the word, Susie, the intimacy of the lesson with them and the individual attention. Okay, so student engagement. So like Kev said, it underpins um, everything in direct instruction. So um, units and response, it's really, really important that students are together. And then as, as teachers who've delivered it, you will know that when they are together, you can normally spot the person who's either got it wrong or perhaps who's coming too soon or too late. And it's really important that your students aren't then come together um, with that unit and response. Now, as well, student engagement is a signal now, it's really important you give the students a signal, but also give them a focus. Now, a lot of times um, people might say in English, it's like it says in the script what word. You must give them the thinking time. You just don't say what word. You need to give them the focus, what word, get ready, and give them that thinking time, and making sure you can see that they've given you the answer correctly. So it's really important that you give them the signal and you also give them that thinking time. Pacing. Now, like I said before, it's important that you don't actually rush, rush through it. It's at that brisk pace. It's at the pace that they can work at. Remember, you're working at their, um, at their pace as well. And it, as well, it, it gives you the opportunity to present more material and they move quicker. They move quicker through the program. And a lot of students who join it might have their own, you know, they might be like, oh, why am I doing DI? Or perhaps, am I doing it all year? But remember, this is only an intervention. It's not long term. This is as soon as you use your, you know, when you use your professional judgment and say, actually, student A has had zero in every single workbook, independent work in their workbook, and in their mastery, you can use your professional judgment and say, actually, this student is too proficient. They're accelerating very quickly. I can then remove them out. So, you know, it's really important you do teach it at that first pace. Motivation and reinforcement. So, um, it's really important that you are giving that positive feedback each time. We can't stress that enough. Mm -hmm. Students work with positive feedback. So we use what we call a thermometer. So we have a thermometer. Uh, Nifty in America introduced us to this, which I think is quite fantastic. Each lesson that they um, master, they get to move up the chart each time. Um, and they can see their progress as well as on their independent work tracker as well. And it's really important you give that positive feedback and tell them why. Just don't say, I'm going to give you two student points there, but they're going to be sat there not wondering why. So I'm going to give Kevin two student points there for setting up tools, for following my instruction and for answering figures. Just give them the reasons why you're giving that positive feedback. So like in DI, if you say, right, we're now going to read the words, first word, what word, get ready, and then say yes, and then you could say, well done, class. We read that first time round without making any errors. I'm going to give you two student points for your effort there and being very clear with your reasons. And don't forget rewarding them as well and giving them positive points for meeting your expectations. I know in DR we use STAR. You might use SLANT in your school if you follow, um, if you follow those expectations. But it's really important that you set the expectations from the very beginning. So if your students are answering on the signal, 
given some positive points, if they're respecting one another, give them, give them positive points. If they're stepping up tall when you said one, two, three, everyone's smart or everyone's star and they're stepped up beautifully, give them a positive point. Always keep giving um, positive, show, you know, show, reward them for their hard work and, and if they're meeting the expectations in your lessons. Okay, so when does it work? Now, um, it's really important that you follow these steps in order for direct instruction to work. So, the placement test. We cannot stress enough how important it is that you actually placement test your students. If they're not carried out correctly, then there's going to be a problem from the very start. Addressing errors and misconceptions immediately. Like I said before, you don't move on to the next lesson until you've addressed those misconceptions. Even if it's one student and they've got two errors in their workbook, you need to address it there and then. Retest them, reteach a section again if you need to. Once you are 100% that that student is um, happy with it, then you move on. You do not move on leaving these misconceptions unaddressed. Ensure that you are recording, okay, the, the daily tracking, that you are recording this um, this data. Um, it's, so that, because the problem we've had in the past at schools go, oh no, we've been tracking the motivational points at the back of their book. That's not what you're tracking. What you're trying to do is you're trying to address these misconceptions immediately, show that you they've made errors, show you've taken remedial action and what you've done, and show that they're progressing from that. So it's really, really important you're tracking the independent work. Uh, you need to embrace the full program and not cherry pick. Don't assume your students know what, um, when you're reading your script, don't assume they know it. Okay, so it's really important that when you buy a program, you buy the correct program for your students by carrying the placement test properly because the placement test does all the, makes all the decisions for you. Okay, so it's really important that you don't just pick it because we're all guilty of teachers. We look at the content of the script and we go, the program, sorry, and we go, oh, I've got year nine, that appears too easy for my year nine. I'm not going to pick that. I'm going to go for the next one. The placement test does it all for you. So it's really important that you embrace the full program and not actually pick sections you feel are going to work for your classes. Be enthusiastic. It's really important that you, um, you know, it doesn't change you as a teacher, okay? Um, it's just a different way of teaching. And it's, a, it, I, you know, Kevin and I have been delivering now for quite a while. And it's fantastic. I've, I've always had, I've always taught the low stream. So if I was introduced to this six, seven years ago, I would definitely be implementing, you know, the, the um, direct instruction in my core subjects as well. And like I said before, positive praise goes all the way. Okay, it does motivate your students. It goes to the impact of uh, direct instruction. Well, it can have a, a real effect on your schools if you implement it correctly. Um, it's really, really important that, uh, as Susie said, the cherry picking is one of the one of the big things we see. Not just on what program you're going to buy into, because the placement test tells you that. But actually, within a lesson, once you're teaching a lesson, missing exercises out because you feel that it's it's too easy for the class. Every exercise, everything builds on the next exercise in direct instruction. And if you take out certain exercises and don't deliver them it would all come tumbling down eventually. And if you if you implement this in your school, it's uh, it's gonna have a real effect on your on your on your school's uh, improvement plan and um, the high level of quality that DI gives you, the students will succeed. So how can we help you? Well, we've got the Direct Instruction South Hub here based at Avonbourne Academy. Uh, we're down in Bournemouth. But we provide quality teaching of direct instruction to our selective students in our school. So me and Susie, we're not salespeople. We're actually teachers of it. We've been teaching this now for, for nearly four years. And uh, you know, we've seen the impact it's had. But we oversee the direct instruction team here at Avonbourne and across the Bournemouth and Paul cluster. So we've got two schools in our cluster that we oversee as well. We oversee 55 schools in the United Learning Trust who have implemented the direct instruction programs, and we offer ongoing training and quality assurance to them. And we also provide first class training and provisions for schools outside the trust across the UK that wish to implement direct instruction. And me and Susie have been up to Newcastle, um, we've been down to, 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 to the southwest London, we've traveled all over the country doing this. and we're, we're we love what we do and we love sharing our practices with you. 
Um, so, and we have a range of support packages as well. So we don't just train you and we disappear. We're always here at the hub to support you because we really want to see direct instruction take off in the UK and, and, and have an impact on many, many children. So once schools are set up, we continue to support them, as I said, uh, and this is all free. The quality assurance we offer in the first year after you've had your training is completely free. We're here, calls, we don't charge for any of that. We're, we're always there, and we will always come back and visit you again three months, six months, nine months down the line, even a year later, just to see how you're getting on. We're trained and accredited by the National Institute of Direct Instruction, NIFTI, and we work closely with them to ensure that our training is delivered to the highest standards here in the UK. So we, uh, we send lessons off where we're observed. Uh, we have um, video lessons that we have to send to NIFTI to make sure that what we're delivering is to the highest standards. So they can be uh, happy over there in the, in the States that what we're delivering and telling you is all the latest practices. And we attend uh, weekly meetings with Kurt Engelman. Um, that's, that's the son of Stig. Uh, and his team, just to make sure that we are up to date with all these practices and also for our ongoing professional development. Okay, so just uh, if you don't already have some information there, so um, direct, direct-instruction.co.uk is our website. Please feel free to, to have a look. It's all got um, information about the, our journey, our case study you can download from the website. Um, we also um, trainings on there as well. So if you are interested in taking up some training or even just a CPD where we can come down and do um, a session or do a session with your staff, happy to do that. Um, there is a section as well that we recommend you look at, which is further reading. Um, we do re we have Kevin and I have um, a CVD library, and we've read quite a, quite a few, or should I say, quite a lot of books. But there's one book we do recommend called Clear Teaching by Shepherd Barbash. Um, if you can get a copy of that book, we do definitely recommend that you um, have a look at that. And like Kev said, we're based, our offices are based at Avonborn Academy, so our website, um, our email address is there, dicelfhub at avonbornacademy.org.uk. And we are also on Twitter as well, so if you uh, don't follow us on Twitter, um, it's di, at dicelfhub, um, and yes, yeah, please do follow us. Um, we like to, we like getting to know new people and obviously those who are in direct instruction. Okay, so question and answers. Yep. Okay, so thank you <laughs> to uh, Susie and Kevin for presenting. We do have some questions. So I appreciate that um, officially we are supposed to finish in three minutes. So we'll probably go for another 10 minutes. Um, and then any questions that we don't manage to answer, obviously we will we'll follow up in an email. And if you do need, do need to drop off the call at 4.30, then by all means, you're not going to miss anything. Like I say, we will follow up in email afterwards and answer all of the questions that we've had. So a couple of questions for Susie and Kevin. So to be effective, I think you may have covered this, but maybe a little bit more detail required. To be effective, how many lessons should be spent on DI each week and how long are the lessons? Um, okay, right. So to be effective, really, we, we, we don't, we, we, we recommend you have a minimum of three hours per week dedicated to DI. That's the minimum. Um, we, we currently run four lessons a week, so eight over the fortnight, because we have a model now where we take the students out of core maths and core um, English, and, it, and it, that makes that transition easier. But if you're doing less than three hours a week, because it's a lot of it's retrieval practice, and these children Lots of them have those retrieval issues. Um, if there's too long between the lessons, you, you start it becomes quite painful trying to to, re, uh, to remember the, the stuff. So three we, three hours minimum a week. Yeah, three hours minimum. Um, yeah, so you can complete the lessons. Well, lessons over those those three hours. Yeah, I think as wow. Susan said, it's not about how many hours. It, it, it might take you two or three lessons on your timetable to complete one DI lesson because it's all about them mastering the exercise, mastering the lessons. So that you don't just need to feel the pressure about the time, but certainly having three hours of DI minimum a week. Yeah, and like I said, Kev said that we've got a model so they only do DI maths 
and they only do DI English. They, they don't do any core English or math. They only do DI. Okay, I think yeah. that answers one of the uh, second questions that we had actually, which was do students do DI maths instead or as well as their classroom maths? So um, hopefully you've answered that one. But um, I guess some schools would be so, looking to so, use so DI are, alongside core as well. There are two models. I mean, we used to do DI alongside core, um, but when we were visited by Ofsted, the, their only concern really um, after it really was that they, they were sort of um, sold on the idea of direct instruction and why we were doing it, but they were worried that the children weren't getting a, a well-rounded curriculum. Um, and actually, it leads to a lot more timetabling issues from a, an admin point of view when you take them out of other lessons particularly if you've got students from different classes. Whereas if they're in core, um, it's just quite a, a straight swap um, that they do it. And because it's an intervention, it's about getting them the skills and then getting them back into core lessons once the, uh, the program's completed. Okay, yeah. so thank you. So another question, what course of action do teachers take when pupils fail to make comparable progress to their peers? Um, well, it, it, because the groups are um, homogenous, um, you know, they're, they're working at the same skill level, but yes, you're right, some students do, um, they, they, they get 100% all the time and others in the class are struggling, but because you're doing the union responses, because of the, the way the lessons are, are set up for the individual terms, you can you can you can manipulate those ones that are doing really well to help you push the ones that aren't doing so well um, along. And uh, it's uh, you can keep them motivated with the student points, with the bonus points. Um, and there's something not actually in the script that when we were trained by Nessie, it's called the seven steps of error correction paradigm. And it's really important that if those students who you feel are behind, this is a really, what we say, a really great tool to use. Well, you should be using it anyway in your DI yeah. lesson, but it's a really great tool to use to kind of eliminate these, you know, these problems moving forward. But I think if you're following it, like Kev said, you can then, you can then, with your individual terms, yeah. you can then choose those students who you feel are probably just a little bit behind from the others. So if you're not very familiar with the seven steps of a correction, correction paradigm, sometimes is where you're going to find um, the struggle within these students where you're not addressing it yeah. in, in a certain way. And um, yeah, so that's it's where the gaps within your class yeah. start to open up. But if you're using the seven steps of error correction, it keeps everybody together. It, it, it does keep them all together. Yeah. So very good question. Oh. That <laughs> okay, so we have a question from Alex, who's um, been delivering direct instruction. So his question is, do you find the initial few lessons take much longer? He started teaching Connecting Maths Level E, and the initial lesson took, I can't see the number of periods, but it obviously took longer than uh, he would have anticipated, so it took a number of periods. Um, and he says, can I expect to see faster progression? And if so, how soon? So I guess what's your initial reaction to uh, delivery of Level E of Connecting Maths and the lessons taking? such a long time and when can he start to see student progression? My, my, my first question um, with that is, is he using, is he a secondary school teacher? I don't know if you can get some quick feedback on that because. Okay. Um, if because Alex is still on the call, some people have dropped off, so maybe we could follow up with oh, him. Uh, no, no, he's primary. Okay, yeah, no, that's oh, primary. So that's okay, cool. It's primary, that's good. I mean, um, if you're using it in Key Stage 2, uh, I would certainly think about moving over to corrective math, um, which is uh, more of an intervention. The lessons are, are between 25 and 45 minutes long, um, and it condenses because CMC, Connecting Math Concepts, is a primary curriculum, and you might find you're struggling if the students haven't done levels A, B, C, and D, that's where maybe the problems are with level E. Um, so correcting, corrective maths is a, is a, is a better program. 
yes, it does start off a little bit slower. I mean, um, the students aren't used to it. Um, the, the teachers, if they're new to delivering it, um, but as you, as you start teaching it and you get into the flow, um, you become more efficient as a teacher, and the students and the, and the students start to respond. Um, but the first ten lessons of any CMC program are usually um, built around getting the teacher and the student used to the content. Um, so after lesson ten, you should start to see it um, flowing um, better. But as I say, um, Connecting Math Concepts is a, a, is a primary curriculum which should start at level A and then move right up to level F and the student should progress through all the levels from reception. Um, so I would suggest if they're working at level E, if that's where they were placed, have a look at them. I can, I can forward on placement tests for corrective maths. I, I know it's a bit of a new, but it would be a good one to use and you'll see the progress there a lot, lot quicker. Okay, thank you very much, um, Alex. Hopefully that helps you and answers your question. So I am aware of the time, so I think we've covered most of the questions today. Um, any that we haven't, like I say, we will follow up in an email to you. So just wanted to say thank you to Susie and Kevin for presenting and sharing their own experience of uh, direct instruction with us. I really feel like it, um, it resonates more when you actually hear from teachers that are delivering it and obviously Susie and Kevin um, training and working with other schools to help implement and deliver direct instruction too. So hope you found the session really useful and that you may start to consider direct instruction in your school to help close the attainment gap. So we've got some contact details here as well. So please feel free to contact myself direct for any questions that you might have, even if it's after this session and you think of something that you felt you should have asked at the time but forgot, by all means just drop us an email and we'll answer any questions that you have. Um, and obviously in future, by all means contact us as well. And like I say, we will follow up on an email with any questions that we haven't answered. And I think there were a couple of questions that we had outside of the chat. So we will follow up on those. So thank you very much for your time and um, have a lovely evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thank Take you. Care. Bye bye. Bye.